wanted to be a paleontologist since I was five or six years old. I had a very imperfect conception of what it was when I was five. I thought it meant going out west and collecting dinosaur bones all your life. But sometimes I look back and say, my goodness, I actually did it. And I've been successful enough at it, and I've enjoyed it as much as I thought I would, and it's as fine a field as I'd ever hoped. So it's very satisfactory. My father was a soldier in World War II, and I didn't see him for a couple of years. And when he came back, his mode of reacquaintance was to take me to every interesting place in New York City. And the Museum of Natural History was, of course, on the agenda. So it must have been sometime in 1946, when I was four or five, maybe 47, I'm not sure. And we went to the Museum of Natural History, and I took one look at the dinosaurs. and. Uh, they were just so interesting. You ask why, you haven't, I mean, one asks always why kids are so fascinated with dinosaurs. I don't really know the answer to that, but it certainly seems persistent. A friend of mine who's an eminent child psychologist once gave an answer, which may be a little oversimplified, but I think is basically pretty good. He says, why are kids fascinated with dinosaurs? That's simple, colon, big, fierce, and extinct, which they certainly are. Maybe that's all it was. But I remember standing under the Tyrannosaurus, and it's pretty big even today, but when you're five, it's a lot bigger, and uh, a man sneezed, and I thought the Tyrannosaurus had come to life and was about to devour me, but uh, after that moment of fear, I just let fascination creep in. Well, I had such an imperfect notion of what paleontology was. I didn't come from a, an academic or intellectual family. I didn't have role models in that sense. So I, I didn't even know the word paleontologist for a while. Every kid knows it today, but there wasn't that kind of media-inspired dinosaur fascination in the late 40s. I knew I wanted to spend my life studying them somehow, but I didn't know that there were professors in universities and that you could write books and papers and give talks and teach. I guess all I thought about was collecting dinosaurs in deserts and working at museums stringing bones together. I had a number of relatives who encouraged my interest in a variety of ways, particularly my father and mother and really all my immediate family. My Uncle Morty is still alive in Rochester at age 92 and was head violist of the Rochester Symphony, he was sort of the family intellectual. And they were, but then, of course, I, I read, but I wasn't. And people sort of assume that anyone who is reasonably successful later must have been a bookish intellectual as a kid. And that really wasn't true with me. I spent most of my afternoons, as I remember, playing stickball or poker, depending on the weather. But uh, I did a certain amount of reading, and reading works of E. H. Colbert, who was the curator of dinosaurs at the museum and later was my teacher, were inspiring. I don't know, but at least they were the books on dinosaurs that were available. Then when I got a little older, I read George Gaylord Simpson, who was the best writer and leading paleontologist of that generation. It is, after all, a fairly standard sequence in American history, isn't it? My grandparents were Eastern European immigrants who went through Ellis Island like everybody else, and you have this three-generational sequence. And my grandparents were in the clothing business and the sweatshops of New York, and then the next generation, uh, my grandparents, then the next generation, my parents sort of scratch their way into the middle classes, but don't become professionals or get a college education. And then the next generation, me, goes on to professional life. Paleontology seemed an oddity. It wasn't the usual path of that third generation that makes it into the professions. Law and medicine is probably more common, but they were totally supportive. I somehow always knew I was going to go to college and be a professional of some sort. I had no idea what college was. I was kind of scary. I thought you had to study all day, which in fact you do. <laughs> what was For my grandparents, who were sort of old country Hungarian and Yiddish speakers, uh, it was, if anything, more of a puzzle, but it sounded wonderful. They were, again, supportive. I remember my grandfather telling me, I really ought to go to MIT because that's the one place he knew about that was a technical education. It had nothing to do with paleontology, but they, they thought it was fine. They were very happy to see a, a grandchild who was obviously intellectually fascinated and who was going to have the opportunities that they had never had. I went to a standard public school in New York City, PS 26. They have numbers there. <laughs> in Queens. But you know, the New York City public school system, for whatever trouble it's in now, and there are still pockets of 
great excellence in it. It was really a wonderful system in the 40s and 50s. It was still working. It was that odd combination of, oh, this is somewhat overly stereotypical, and I don't really mean it this way, but it was sort of tough old-fashioned Irish teachers and enormously warm-hearted Jewish teachers and many others, uh, many of whom had gotten their jobs in the 30s, right in the heart of the Depression when there was no work available, and absolutely the best people could be hired for these jobs. Many of them stayed with. A lot of them were tough and cynical, but when there was a good student, they could be inspired. I was lucky. I had very good teachers. I dedicated one of my books, The Panda's Thumb, to my third, fifth, and sixth grade teachers. Now, you notice my fourth grade teacher was not included. <laughs> you don't have good ones every year. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, for the most part, I it wasn't a specially enriched education in any modern sense or what you might get in an elite private school, but I think I got a good, solid education. I learned grammar, which I'm not sure they teach anymore. I got a good, solid foundation in all sorts of things, and there was no discouragement, and it was, I got no complaints. I think if you asked any decent writer why they write, the honest answer could only be because they have to, because there's a personal need, because there's a struggle to compose that elusive, perfect essay, which you can never do, but you can come closer sometimes than others. I think all good writers fundamentally write for themselves, and that's legitimate, as long as it's a decent personal motivation. On the other hand, we have moral responsibilities as human beings. We're a social species. We have our families, our relatives, our co-religionists, our co-nationalities, our brother and sisterhood with everyone on the planet. So yes, I think we do have larger ethical responsibilities. And if someone asked me when I'm 80 years old and about to depart what I was most satisfied with, I hope what I'll be able to say is that I think my life has been useful.